Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about space-time diagrams. These diagrams are a very neat way to visualize some important ideas in special relativity, and we'll be looking at how to understand these ideas using our diagrams, as well as how to construct these diagrams in the first place. So if you enjoy this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So first things first, what exactly is a space-time diagram and what is it trying to show? Well, on a very simple level, it's just a graph that we can use to show the position of objects as time passes. For example, let's imagine we have a table tennis ball sitting on a table. It's not moving anywhere, and let's say it's three meters away from this point here, which we will randomly choose to be our origin. It doesn't really matter what point we choose, so let's just go with this one here. We can represent this ball and how it moves over time on our space-time diagram. These are the axes of our diagram, with x representing the position of our object in the x-direction, t being time, and c being the speed of light. We'll see why we use ct in a short while. Now, at that very first moment in time that we start to think about the ball, we can say that this is time t is equal to zero. Its position is three meters away from the origin. So let's say this is three meters on the x-axis. Now, since the object is not moving at all, its position will continue to be three meters as time passes. So at t is equal to one second, the ball will still be at three meters, and also at t is equal to two seconds, and at any other time. We can connect up our dots to show the ball's position at any time. What we've drawn here is known as the world line of our ball. Pretty cool name, right? Now, it's worth noting what we've drawn so far is basically just a distance time or a displacement time graph, except with the distance or displacement of our object on the horizontal axis, rather than the vertical axis, which is what we may be more used to. The other axis is also basically just a time axis, but with this scaling factor, c, the speed of light. This way, we don't actually end up plotting time values on this diagram, but rather time values multiplied by the speed of light. Thus, the values that we plot have the same units as the displacement on this axis. It's also worth noting that here we're looking at a Minkowski diagram, a specific kind of space-time diagram that only looks at the motion of an object or multiple objects through time and one dimension in space, in this case, the x direction. More general space-time diagrams also exist, but we won't go into them here. Now, let's talk about why space-time diagrams are useful. Firstly, let's look at what the world line would look like for an object moving at a constant speed. Doesn't really matter what that speed is, but let's say that the object started here, then sometime later it was here, then the same amount of time later it was here. We could plot these points on our space-time diagram and the world line would look like this. So an object moving with a constant speed has a straight line as its world line. All of this may be familiar to you if you've studied distance time or displacement time graphs before in high school physics, for example. But anyway, let's now think about a couple of events happening here in this scenario and how we would show them on our space-time diagram. In relativity, an event is defined when we can give something four coordinates. One time coordinate, t, and three spatial coordinates, sometimes x, y, z. For simplicity, we're only considering t and x here, and basically ignoring the y and z coordinates for now. But we can extend the logic we're using here to these other spatial dimensions quite simply as well. Let's say we want to think about an event where a light bulb gets switched on. Let's say this happens at a time t1, and the bulb is at the x coordinate x1 when this happens. On our space-time diagram, we can represent these two coordinates like this. Notice that we're not drawing full world lines here because we're only representing the event where the light bulb is switched on. We're not looking at the motion of the light bulb through space and time at this point. So we only care about a point rather than a world line. And let's say we have another light bulb being switched on at another point in space, x2, at a time t2. We could represent it like this on our space-time diagram. Why is this useful? Well, this diagram can very easily be used to show us whether there could be some form of communication or information transfer between these two events. In other words, could the first event send some signal to the second event 
before it happens and potentially actually cause the second event to happen? To answer this question, we can first remember that in the theory of relativity, the fastest that any object can move through the universe is at the speed of light. This is a postulate or assumption that the theory is based on. And we have pretty good evidence to suggest that it is true in our real universe as well. But anyway, for an object moving at the speed of light, such as a photon, we can draw its world line on our space-time diagram. Its speed is of course c, the speed of light, so it moves this distance in a time of one second. Now remember, on this axis we're plotting ct, not just time by itself. So this axis will have the same numerical value plotted on it as we do for the horizontal axis. And we can think about what would happen at a time of two seconds, for example. Well, in this time, the photon has moved a distance of 2c, and on the vertical axis, again, we want to plot a numerical value of c times the time. So the numerical value would end up being two times the speed of light value. All of this to say that any photon traveling at the speed of light, which is what photons do, has a nice world line that is 45 degrees to either of the axes. This is one of the reasons why we plot ct on this graph rather than just the time t. It allows us to give the fastest possible objects in the universe a world line that is nice and easy to visualize on this diagram. Any objects moving at a constant speed slower than a photon will have a world line on this side of the 45 degree line as they move a smaller distance for the same amount of time passing. And this allows us to come back to our two events. We were talking about whether the first event could send a signal of some sort to the location and time of the second event before the second event actually took place. Or in other words, could event one potentially have caused event two? The answer to this question is yes. And we can easily see this by drawing a 45 degree line out from event one. Since event two is on this side of the 45 degree line, this means that a signal even slower than light, maybe a really fast electron beam, could be sent from event one as soon as it happens to event two and arrive before event two happens or just as it happens. This is important because this means that the two events are causally connected. It is possible that event one caused event two because the signal from event one could reach event two before it actually happened. Now with two light bulbs, it's unlikely that the switching on of one caused the other one to turn on. But remember, these events could actually be anything that we want to represent. Like me clicking the switch on a circuit, that's one event, and a light bulb switching on along the circuit, that could be event two, for example. If the switch is connected to the bulb, then these events would have to be causally linked in order for a signal to be sent to the bulb and in order for it to switch on. That doesn't necessarily mean that my switch is the one that causes that bulb to turn on because my switch could have been part of a different circuit. But the fact is that it is possible that my switch was the one that caused it to switch on. If, however, event two was on this side of our 45 degree line, then there is no way that these two events are causally connected. Nothing in the universe can move fast enough for event one to happen and then for a signal to be sent to two and then for two to happen. In other words, these events are independent events. They have nothing to do with each other. And so this is one thing that we can very easily figure out from just looking at a space-time diagram. Are two events causally connected? If they lie this side of the 45 degree line, then they are causally connected because a signal can be transmitted from one to the other between when the events happen. If the two events lie exactly on the 45 degree line, then only light or anything that travels at the speed of light, electromagnetic radiation, can causally link them. But they are still causally linked, just that this is the most extreme case. And if our space-time diagram looks something like this, then the two events are independent and they cannot be causally linked because there's nothing that can travel fast enough to cause the second one after the first one has happened. In fact, if we now consider an event at this point in space and time, we can draw 45 degree lines from it in either direction actually. The reason we do this is because another event can be on either side of it in terms of the x spatial direction. Whether it's to the left of our object or to the right of our object doesn't matter. So any event in this part of the diagram is said to be in the future of event one. This means that event one could communicate with event two and potentially be the cause of event two. 
On the other hand, any event here in our space-time diagram is said to be in the past of event 1 and could have potentially caused event 1 to occur. And finally, any event here or here on our space-time diagram is independent from event 1 and cannot be caused by it or cause it. Now here's where things get even more interesting. In special relativity, not only is the speed of light the fastest speed possible, but it is also measured to be exactly the same by any observer. This means that two observers could be moving relative to each other. So let's say observer one is stationary in our current reference frame and observer two is moving in this direction with a flashlight. Assuming observer two is moving at a constant speed, observer two would measure the speed of light from the flashlight to be C, which makes sense, they're moving with the flashlight, but then observer one would also measure it to be C. They would not measure the speed of light to be C plus V, which is what we might normally expect. In order for observers to all measure the speed of light as being the same, regardless of their motion relative to each other, they must experience space and time slightly differently to each other. This results in effects like length contraction and time dilation. There are lots of good videos about this on YouTube and I'll leave some resources in the description box below if you want to find out more about them. Interestingly though, we can create space-time diagrams for two different reference frame on the same graph. Now, because two observers or two different reference frames will always measure the speed of light to be the same value, and as a result, they experience space and time slightly differently to each other, a space-time diagram for an observer that is moving relative to us can be drawn like this. We draw these axes for the reference frame moving at a speed v relative to our original reference frame, which has these axes. This is just a nice way to represent the difference between two reference frames, one which is ours and one which is the reference frame of the observer moving at a speed v relative to us. I'll make another video in the future talking in more detail about why this other observer's reference frame looks like these axes have been squished. But for now, let's just understand that the faster the new reference frame moves relative to our original one, the more squished its axes will become. It's also worth noting that for this new reference frame, constant position values are found along lines that are parallel to the CT axis. And similarly, constant CT values are along the lines parallel to the x-axis. So we don't have nice, neat 90 degree angles going on here anymore. But here's a cool thing. In our original reference frame, if we have two events like this, then it is possible to find a reference frame moving at a certain speed where these two events happen at exactly the same time in the new reference frame even though they happen at different times in our original reference frame. This is one of the ways in which two different reference frames experience time slightly differently to each other. One person will say that two events happened one after the other, and another person will say that those two events happened at exactly the same time. Which one of them is correct? Both of them. This is the interesting thing. The whole principle of relativity says that as long as we're not dealing with accelerating reference frames, any of these so-called inertial reference frames are equally valid as each other. And in this theory, we throw away the idea of absolute time, which is what we've been using for so long and is still intuitive to us. And that idea is one where it doesn't matter whether you're stationary or you're moving or whatever, everybody experiences time exactly the same. Now, there have been experiments done about this to see if different reference frames really do experience time slightly differently. And so far, every experiment we've done shown that this assumption is correct for relativity. Anyway, so if we now have two events that look like this on our original reference frame or original space-time diagram happening at different x values, it is possible to find a reference frame where they happen at the same place or rather at the same x prime coordinate in our new reference frame. I find this pretty interesting. Now, I'd like to make another video, as I said, discussing all of this in even more detail. So let me know if you'd like to see it down below. But this video is getting long enough, so please hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more fun physics content. Check out some of my merch in the description below. It's got a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of my Giga patrons, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon. That's also linked down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching as always, and I will see you very soon.